So desiring blessings is a good thing. But it's good to understand being blessed is being blessed by the Lord and is being protected by God. Verse, verse 26 goes on to say, The Lord turn his face toward you. I think this is symbolic. If God has turned his face towards me, it means he notices all my needs, notices all my risks, notices all my fears, and deals with all of them. May the Lord truly turn his face toward you. You know, if the king looks at you, notices you, good thing could happen on earth. What about if it is in heaven? And the king of kings and the lord of lords has turned his face toward you. Good will happen. Can you see the blessing, what is being called ironic blessing? It's a blessing, it's a blessing of protection. It's a blessing of God's face turned toward you. That he, he takes care of you. He's concerned about you. He's aware about you. Like he told the children of Israel when they were suffering in Egypt, I have looked, I have seen, and I'm coming. May that be your experience. To learn that as long as you live under the blessing of God, he has his face turned toward you and that there is nothing you are going through he is unaware about and that there is nothing that will ever come your way which he has not saved to ensure that he cannot destroy you and that right in the middle of the suffering he is going to be with you but um, this ironic blessing he is not only praying that the Lord blesses, that the Lord keeps, that the Lord turns his face towards the subject of blessing, but he's also praying that the Lord will give you peace. And peace is a very fragile thing. Because you see, peace is not lack of war. There are many people who, as far as you can see, have a good family, good children, good spouse. They look wealthy, but they have no peace. Because peace is that inner sense that all is well. It's not that the situation is in control by you but that the situation is under control by one who cannot be defeated. Peace cannot depend upon you because you know your weakness. You know your challenges. Peace be, depends on the Prince of Peace, the Lord. And in the ironic, bless, the ironic blessing it includes that the peace of God will be with you. Where you may be in the middle of turmoil, but you sense that this situation is terrible. But the situation is under God's control. And at the right moment, you snap it short. And it will not destroy me. Then you end up in peace. That's why Philippians chapter 4 is calling it peace beyond understanding. You have just lost your loved one. You have just fallen sick. You've just been pronounced with a, with, a, with a terminal disease. And your heart is at peace. Why? Because you know God is in control of this also. So the ironic blessing is, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. That's a total blessing. In Numbers chapter 6, verse 24. Verse 27, commenting on this blessing says, so they will put, the priest, so they will put my name on the other side and I'll bless them. So he repeats the same thing at the end of it. It's not, the anonic blessing is not a blessing from Aaron. 
is a blessing from God. The work of Aaron is not to bless, but to pray for blessings. Yet in verse 23, it was blessing of the priest. This is how you are to bless the Israelites. That's Aaron being told. Tell Aaron and his sons, this is how you are to bless the Israelites. In other words, Moses is saying this is a blessing of Aaron. But when you now read the blessing itself, it's a prayer. May all parents who seek the blessing of their children understand how inadequate they are. To, they have no capacity to bless their children, but that they should pray for their children because the one who can truly bless, bless is God. Blessing is not from man. It's not from parents. It's a prayer from God. Having said so, may children learn that they will be blessed by God when they obey God and relate well with their parents. In other words, your parents don't have to have educated you. Your parents don't have to have done any good to you. Their parents may not even like you, but respect them and honor them. And if you do so, you are assured of blessings from God. In the wilderness, the Israelites had no temple. Instead, they had a tabernacle. <laughs> it's interesting. You find some churches are called temples. Some churches are called tabernacles. There's a great desire by New Testament believers to wish they were in the Old Testament. That's why even a pastor who calls himself a priest, knowing very well that in the book of Acts, Paul never became a priest. Peter never became a priest. The people of the New Testament did not have a priest. Why is it that they had no priest? Because they had no tabernacle. They had no temple. And the work of the priest was done in the temple and was done in the tabernacle. So we need to understand as New Testament believers, again, like I've been saying, the Old Testament, you can draw principles but the details are not for the New Testament believer because they were a precursor of what would happen in the New Testament. So if you want to know the role of pastors, you don't check the Old Testament to find them. The New Testament describes it. Titus, both Titus and Timothy who are young pastors were told exactly who an elder was and what his work was who an overseer was, what his work is. So you don't have to go to the Old Testament in order to discover the role of leaders. But Numbers chapter 7, verse 8 and 9 says, When Moses entered the tent of meeting to speak with the Lord, he heard the voice speaking to him, from between the two cherubim above the atonement cover on the Ark of the Covenant law. In, on the Ark of the Covenant law, in, the, in, this, in this way, the Lord spoke to him. You know, the temple, the tabernacle has just been dedicated. And the special thing that is in the tabernacle is really just an Ark, kind of a box a coffin like box and inside the box all there is are the the, the the ten commandments that were given by god on mount sinai but the critical thing is it was called the tent of the the tent of meeting the tabernacle was a tent of meeting why because it was the place where god met his people it was set apart as a place for God to meet his people. And I think it's important to, to understand that God created this as a visual aid 
for his relationship with man that uh, there would be a place a specific place where if you went you have stopped all other issues in order to spend time with god and i think that's uh, that's important then to understand what's the tabernacle was a temple is a place of meeting god and it was set apart and it had an ark of covenant representing god it did not mean that god is in the ark they knew he's not in the ark they knew he's the god of the whole universe but it was a representation so similarly your place of prayer a place you have chosen to meet God is not where God is. And that needs to be fully understood. If you go to a prayer center, do not think that God is in the prayer center more than he is in your bedroom or more than he is in your sitting room or more than he is wherever you choose to pray to him. It's not the physical circumstances that determine you are meeting the Lord is your faith and dedication to him. And so you need, we need to have a similar view that we have chosen a place to meet God. And then when you go there, it's a way of reminding yourself, not reminding God, God is everywhere. Reminding yourself that here, I don't come with my bills. I don't come with my bank account. I come alone to go to talk to him. And I know he is willing to talk to me. Therefore, you can call it a place of meeting. And it's not bad to have such a place where you, your family knows when you are there, you should not be disturbed. The phone is off. The phone is not allowed in the place of prayer, you are totally committed. For that one hour, or two hours, or three hours, or 10 minutes, or 15 minutes, whatever the time you have dedicated. Like Moses, you have gone to the tent of meeting, meeting God. And because you are going there to meet God, you go in repentance, and you go to seek God's blessings. When Moses entered the tent of meeting to speak with the Lord. That's number 7 verse 8 and 9. In other words, you shouldn't go to the place of meeting to simply tell God things. Although that's part of speaking. If you are speaking with someone, it means that you have to listen to him also. He might ask you questions. You might ask him questions. That's what you call speaking. So the tent of meeting we learn is a place where Moses would speak to the Lord. And that's why in your time of dedicated to meeting God, there must be prayers, yes, talking to God, but there must be meditation. That's why the Bible should go there with you. Because we believe that the, 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 the Bible is God's word. It's God speaking to us. So you can't say you are in a place of meeting God. And the word of God has no role or place. How will you be meeting God if you don't want him to talk to you? And don't want him to correct you? When Moses entered the tent of meeting, what was he going there to do? To speak to the Lord. It's my, my hope and prayer that on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, on an annual basis, you will set the time when you and God can meet, when you and God can have fellowship, and that you will listen, not just talk, Listen to God. What is he telling you today? Is there a sin to confess? Is there a warning to heed? Is there an example to follow? Like the words, the questions we normally have in the daily guide. So, when Moses entered the tent of meeting to speak to the Lord, he heard the voice 
speaking to him from between the two cherubim above the atonement cover on the ark of the covenant law. In other words, God actually did speak to Moses and he heard him. Also, we are told, you know, that God would talk to, talk to Moses face to face, not in a dream like he did with other prophets. And even today, God does speak to us. Sometimes it be just an impression in the mind as you are meditating. But sometimes it pops up. You read a verse and it has a new meaning, a clear meaning that is so relevant to your current circumstances. You know God is talking to you. The only thing is you need to be aware is that when God talks to us, according to Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 to 4, he no longer says things that are in contradiction with his son. Because in these last days, he tells us in the book of Hebrews chapter 1, he has chosen to speak through us through his son. That means, whatever it is you hear God saying, must be consistent with what the son has already said. Which is what the Bible is all about. Especially the New Testament. So you must, if you hear something and it's not in line with the Bible, then be suspicious about which spirit is talking to you. Because if it is God, he will never contradict what's in the 66 books of the Bible. So the verse 89 ends by saying, in this way, the Lord spoke to him. It's my prayer that all of us will experience this God speaking to us. The world is full of so many, many confused things that we are seeking to know the best course of action. Sometimes the responsibility is on a parent leading his children, such as the guests in two teenage can be so confusing. How wonderful it is to know, like Moses, we can go to our place of meeting, whichever it is you have chosen, to meet him. And be assured that God will listen to us. And that he will not only listen to us, he will talk to us and give us guidance as to the best course of action. And that having known the best course of action, we are going to be obedient and do the things God's way, assured of God's blessings. Ever heard of the missionary who said, God's work done in God's way never lacks God's resources. China was so huge, and the missionary was wondering how would it how would it ever be covered? But he was assured, if you're actually doing God's work, and if you do God's work in God's way, it will never lack God's resources. May the Lord help us to determine to live our lives for him, so that we are doing God's work, even if it's parenting, even if it is entrepreneurship, to be God's work, done in God's way, so it can get God's resources. So number 789 establishes there's a time when you meet God. And that does not mean God is not with you everywhere. It's not the message of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17, pray without ceasing. What does that mean? There will be a time set for prayer, maybe on a daily basis, on a weekly basis. But even when it's not time for prayer, God is with you because he is omnipresent. And because he is with you, you can whisper a prayer to him in the middle of your board meeting, in the middle of a crisis. 
you can actually whisper a prayer. Be present to be with you. Yes, there's a time you should set apart to pray. But do not get the impression that you left God in that place. That will be the wrong God you believe in. The God you believe in is not geographical, is not vocational. He is everywhere concurrently, all at the same time. That's why he, in blessing you, it does not stop him blessing your children. In blessing your children, does not stop him from blessing their cousins. Because he's a God who is everywhere and able to be a blessing everywhere. May the Lord help us to meet him, both at special times, but also all the time to be conscious of God's blessings everywhere and all the time so that we are assured with him so that when he calls us home it will just be a completion of a relationship that has been going on on earth. 